Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Mass Effect. In the last episode, we arbitrated the hostile takeover of a kind of criminal gang by Helena Blake, but then we decided, even with her at the helm, still too dangerous, so we convinced her to disband it, which was awesome. This episode, we will be going around doing a few more side quests. Specifically, there was one we acquired last episode from Garrus uh, that we'll definitely be doing this episode, but first, we have some more business, because there is this system here, not that one. Cacus, or Cacus, or however you pronounce it. This only unlocks, this p system and Plutus both only unlock when you have at least 75% of either Paragon or Renegade points. Since we've got 75% plus Paragon, they both unlock for us. So we're gonna head to Cacus first. So, the Cacus system is, uh, oh, Cacus, I don't know. All the pronunciations, pronunciations even, for it sounds stupid. Cacus or Cacus or Seekus, Seekus, they all sound daft. Anyway, yeah, this was where we got the mission a few episodes ago, Besieged Base, for getting a lot of, of Paragon points. But we're not going to be doing that straight away. We're actually going to be doing some scanning first. We need to scan Faringor. Um, and yeah, when we scan, that reveals the deposit of Polonium which is one of the rare metals, um, and then this one in the middle, Zyarter, Zyarter. Um, when we light that up, light that up? I was reading what it said there about lighting things up. That reveals a large deposit of mercury. Yeah, there it was talking about lights appearing on the planet mysteriously. I'll read out the planet descriptions in the few special cases where I think they're really in interesting, but usually they're not. Sometimes they're just, this is a gas giant composed of mercury and silicon. Anyway, Kohei is the planet we want to be on. I always want to read that as Chloe, but I know it's not. Um, so yeah, Chloe is where Besiege Base takes place. Kohei is a terrestrial planet whose surface is mainly composed of aluminium, with numerous deposits of calcium. Though it has enough mass to retain a dense atmosphere, Kohei is nearly a vacuum. This lack of atmosphere allows a moderate average temperature, but the differences between night and day are extreme. The surface of Kohei's sunward facing side is co usually covered by a haze of volatiles, mainly water vapour and gamma dioxide, which return to the ground as frost over the course of a long, cold night. The Serta Foundation has established a research outpost on Kohei to investigate the native subterranean life, which shows incredible resistances to the extremes of heat and cold. So, you know the rules when we first land on a planet, it's leveling up time, but... Oh, Garrus' textures, there we go, they hadn't loaded properly for a while. It's just Garrus, so we just need to give him a quick point in agent. My textures didn't load properly either there, and I looked extremely ugly. And this is... Oh, we're on a snowy planet again, uh, as we've been on every planet recently we've been on the past few episodes. Seems to have been a snowy one. Um, that's not true, actually. Amaranthine wasn't, but we seem like we've been on a lot of snowy ones. Also, here's an interesting thing. That moon you can see up there... Um, is that is Mars like well it's not actually but the actual image used on the oh bollocks the actual imagery used to make that texture is Mars the valley on it has been kind of the valley is the one of the I think it's the Great Rift Valley one of the big valleys on Mars that's not that big it doesn't take up half the damn planet of Mars but it's quite big but they've just kind of ripped that texture and used that up there which is slightly odd especially considering they also use that texture for another point later in the game where it's actually a plot importance but i'll talk about that more when we get to it and that's not going to be for a few episodes time classic clendigan anyway we had a sample of plutonium there also you'll notice i have some of the coolest armor in the game now um this is the colossus series armor this black and red one it's um rex has got that armor and now so have i and it's probably one of the best armors in the game definitely for kind of a medium armor anyway you can just see on the edge of the radar here, there is an anomaly over to which I am heading. That was unusual syntax. Now, if you look to the radar, you will see that there are bad men here. Um, and indeed, there is basically a... Well, we'll ignore the bad men for now, actually, because what is on the ground... Ah! Ground here is a corpse. And if we examine it, it says this person must have died while attempting to salvage a crashed satellite. And indeed, next to them is a crashed satellite. But we can't salvage it at the moment because we're being shot at. You can fight these guys on foot if you want, but you can clean them up extremely fast in the uh, Mako. Even though they have apparent anti-tank stuff, which is just these dudes with rockets. As I've, I've mentioned in the past, infantry versus Mako, Mako wins. Every damn time. So let's salvage. I sure don't think we can even salvage this one. No, we can't. The whole point of it is it's a trap to lure you here for the, where the mercenaries have their way with you. Anyway, all the way down now to the south is another point to which I'm heading. Again, with the strange syntax. And there's just a crash probe here that you can salvage as ever, because this is rubble! Everyone's favourite has some useless stuff in it. I never use proton rounds, they're really weird. That They do more damage to shields, but less damage to the person. But most people don't have shields on this. Anyway, if we head across to the east... Then we see this. 
Large flat areas on worlds usually tend to mean one thing. Whenever you see these areas, be suspicious! Guess it's a Thresher Moor. Uh, this is, the, however, the perfect situation to fight the Thresher Moor on foot, which is why you'll notice I brought Ashley and Garrus, my two squad members, ah, who are trained in long range combat. Uh, Garrus is dead already, but to be honest, like, Squad mates are useless against Thresher Moors. <laughs> they just die instantly, but I am pretty much... Basically, as long as you just move left and right between each shot and dodge the purple... Purple? Green. Then you're fine. So, oh dear. Oh, that one hit me, but didn't really do anything. Anyway, I'm just gonna cut to killing this thing. And there we go. It takes a while, but it's pretty safe. The standard rule with Thresher Moors is if you're close enough to see its health, you're too close to it. Assault rifles and pistols work, but they're slow. Sniper rifles is the best way to do it, and as long as you keep moving left and right, you'll generally be fine, and you get a ton of experience, because actually, we leveled up from that, so might as well do that. I will give myself first aid, because I love first aid. Uh, Ashley can have fitness. I'm just trying to keep all her skills roughly even, apart from damping, because I hate damping, and it's a pointless skill. Uh, well, like, it's useful to have, but the upgrades on it don't seem to make it much better. I use it so rarely, it's worth having it, but not worth actually, like, improving it. Anyway, there's a mercury deposit here, and this must be an extremely cold world for mercury to be solid. Mercury, one of only two metals, I believe, that is liquid at room temperature. Therefore, this must be way below room temperature, as probably should be evidenced by all the fucking snow around. Good one, Doctor. Anyway, over to continuing on to the east is the actual plot point for UNC Besiege Base. And I'm not going to cut over it to, to it because we can see it on the edge there. Oh, there we go. There is the base what has been besieged. And so if you remember, the brief here was there were scientists who'd basically been drugged by biotic terrorists and have had their minds kind of addled. And we need to take up the terrorists while preventing as much collateral damage on the, um, on the, what are they called? Scientists as possible. So for that reason, I'm actually gonna go to the, not the map, gonna go into the options menu and change some shit up. Specifically, squad power usage. This says how much your squad use talents. If you put them on active, means they will use all of their powers as much as they want. Defense only is the best one here because there's two, there's quite a high chance on this. It's, well, it's not a high chance, but there is a very real chance on this mission that your squad mates will use a defensive power, will use an offensive power even, um, like, Garrus might use Overload or something like that, and if one of the scientists gets caught in the blast of that, they'll die. You really want to avoid as many civilian casualties on this mission as possible, so it's worth saying it to defensive only, so they'll only use stuff like shield boost and immunity and things like that. So yeah, it's saying now take down the terrorists, but check your targets. The civilians will just completely wander around, so that's why I'm on my pistol, and I'm probably not even going to use Overkill, to be honest. Your enemies aren't, well, they can be annoying, but they're not too difficult, um, but you've just really got to kind of make sure you just watch your fields of fire. Zoom in with Al. Hey, look at that. Um, right. See, these are the insane scientists. One hit from them and they will almost certainly die. And you've just got to make sure you're very careful there. Oh, that's Ashley, not an insane scientist. The bi biotics don't have much shields and much shields don't have many shields. I don't know. Both of those sound wrong. Um, but yeah, like as long as you're, they shouldn't actually give you much of a problem. The main challenge here has just got to be A, avoiding the, um, well, Firstly, putting up the annoying text saying, I will destroy you repeatedly. But yeah, they can hit you with biotics and it'll end up on the floor a lot. But generally, the main challenge here is avoiding the scientists rather than actually, like, having a difficult combat with the biotics. I think we're pretty much cleaned up in here. And once you're into these back rooms, there isn't... I don't think there are any insane scientists back here, so... Yep, there we go. You've cleared the facility. All the civilians are safe. They're still chattering to themselves and screaming at the garbage cans. Evolution of humanity, huh? These biotics didn't seem that different from the other scum you deal with. And that's an extremely simple mission. I mean, what, like, nine minutes in and we've already polished off a mission. There's some stuff around here as well, like there's an upgrade kit. There's a malfunctioning object. There's a locked crate. There's another locked crate. And there's an unlocked crate. And that's just about done here. If you talk to- oh, there's a secure crate over there, actually. If you talk to the scientists- if I don't hold still. It will all spill out, and then I won't be me anymore. I won't be me if it all spills out. Yeah, if you talk to any of the scientists, they just talk shit. Where is that? I swear I saw a secure storage thing somewhere, but now I don't know where it's gone. Hmm, let's retrace my steps. Ha! It's hiding down here, I knew it was here somewhere. You don't get much of a reward from this quest. Um, like, you get some experience and some average, like, equipment here, but... 
Which is unusual to say how difficult it actually is to obtain the quest, that you can only get it by having like a lot of Paragon points. Uh, but hey, it's one of the quests that's kind of often easy to skip out because it's difficult to like, I've been, you have to play through most of the game, like I've already basically done, to get the enough Paragon points to activate this. Unless you use the Loric Keen glitch, which works for getting this, or this one's corresponding mission, which is basically the inverse of this mission that you get for having a lot of Renegade points um, that we'll be doing in a few episodes time. Next episode, actually. But anyway, let's head back to the surface. Now, there is only one point left on this planet, which is up to the north and slightly to the east. Now, this little camp here is quite unusual. There's nothing else really like it in the game. I will explain what I mean. First, it's got this fuel tank here, which is great fun to explode. Observe. Because <laughs> it does a prop well, extremely low texture. But inter uh, low quality texture, but interesting looking explosion. But anyway, this little slot crate here. And if you decrypt it, then you get some stuff. And while sifting through the pile of debris, you discovered another of Matriot Dillonaga's writings. It's in bad shape, but almost all of it is, but most of it's still intact. Then there's this transmitter tower that you can deactivate, and it says, close to the transmitter, your comms pick up the recording of a wistful string quartet. You power the system down. Whoever lived here, they haven't been back for some time. The crates are covered in Kohei's chalky dust, and the status lights of the shack indicate its atmosphere ran out long ago. But actually, if we go inside the stack, check, ah, shack, there is some stuff of use. There's a technician kit, which has some stuff in it. And it looks like someone has been living in this place. The small crate held some stale food and one of Matriarch Dillonaga's writings. It's still in fairly good condition, unlike the food. Two Matriarch's writings right next to each other. Extremely strange. There's also this secure wall safe, which you can decrypt. To get some more useful stuff. And... It's not clear who owns this container, but you discovered one of Matriarch Dillonaga's writings inside it. There was clearly some Matriarch Dillonaga scholar living here, or it's a weird glitch in the game, because none of them, none of those descriptions sound like they're aware of the other descriptions, if you get what I mean. Uh, but yes, that's us actually finished here. Well, that's us finished here, and more importantly, that's us finished, technically, with the Matriarch's writings quest, because we've got as many as we need. I think the ten we need, we have now got. Um, but as with Prothean data discs, there are still more in the world, and I do plan to go through them, which just, we, the, the quest is now actually finished. So, let's head back to the Normandy. Message coming in. Patching it through. I didn't think it could be done, Commander. You managed to secure the base and neutralize the bionics without a single civilian casualty. Just doing my job, Admiral. I couldn't let innocent lives be lost. I wish every soldier had your definition of just doing your job. You're a credit to the uniform, Shepard. We're in your debt. Fifth lead out. So, we've got about seven or eight minutes left. So, if you remember how the last episode finished, it was with um, a with a conversation with Garrus, where he gave us the coordinates to the ship of a Solarian geneticist, Dr. Salian, who he'd been chasing for doing organ cloning and all sorts of unethical stuff. And so, in the end of this episode, we're going to go and investigate those coordinates. I don't like talking while we're going through a mass relay. It's really loud, even with my headphones on minimum volume. I can barely hear myself speak, and I speak pretty loudly. Um, so, we're in the Herschel system here in the uh, Kepler Verge, um, and there's a few things... Oh, wow! I was, I'd forgotten that asteroid was there. That was fortunate. I just happened to run over it. So yeah, that contains a large deposit of platinum. Then there's also not much in here, actually, as far as I can remember. That's what... Yeah, that was the thing with this system. I'm now remembering that none of the planets actually have any valuable scans on it. But what we do want is here in orbit around Klugon. Brilliant name. <laughs> there is the MSV Fidel. And it's, you'll notice, registry as private owner Dr. R. Hart, which is the pseudonym that Dr. Salion was going under. Let's board it. In terms of who to take on this push mission, it's pretty much down to you. Um, just take whoever you're comfortable with. But I would strongly recommend, for obvious reasons, bringing Garrus along. I've chosen for Liara because I like Liara, and we're doing the whole romance thing, so why the fuck not? You will see bad men on the radar, and this is why Liara is also kind of useful, because when we come around the corner, we see... Test subjects. Ow. 
And you'll notice these, they call them test subjects, but in reality, these are basically Thorian Creepers, but kind of slightly remodeled. Uh, well, not even remodeled, they look the same, but they're supposed to be some kind of crazy test subject, but hey, we know they're Thorian Creepers. And that's all of them for, for, for now. Well, that's all of them, actually. Generally, that is all the combat in this mission, because it's a tiny little mission. Um, so that's quite cool, and well, it's not quite cool at all. They're actually the victims of horrible experimentation by the looks of it but that's us done in terms of like the actual combat part of the mission i'm just going to quickly level up liara while i remember we'll give her a point in lift and a point in throw and then there's various rooms you can get to here but the one you want to go to is this one to the right thank you thank you for saving me from those things commander that's him that's dr Saleon. what my name is hart dr hart please get me out of here are you sure it's him Positive. There's no escape this time, Doctor. I'd harvest your organs first, but we don't have the time. You're crazy. He's crazy! Please, don't let him do this to me. We'll take him in, drop him off with the military. But we have him. We can't let him get away. Not again. If he dies, we'll never know what he's been up to, or how he did it. We'll take him in, interrogate him, and he'll serve his time. I... Okay. You're right. You're a very lucky Salarian. You owe the Commander your life. Oh, thank you so very much. And so he dies anyway. What was the point of that? You can't predict how people will act, Garrus. But you can control how you'll respond. In the end, that's what really matters. Yeah. I don't think I ever met anyone like you, Commander. Well, I guess we're done here. Salian's medical equipment is stained with the blood of many species. Pale blue, violet, orange, and more than a few dark red. But his work has ended here. Time to head back to the Normandy. Well, not before scavenging the evidence from here, but yeah, that's a, that's a very short mission, that one. And there's a couple of other ways through it, but they're so boring, I didn't even bother recording any alternate footage for them. Um, because basically, if you if you, if you you say, take him down, Garrus, or say, time to finish this, Doctor, then the same thing happens, he runs, and you kill him, instantly. Um, but if you'd, then you don't get the bit of extra conversation with Garrus of kind of explaining it. So basically, either way, Salion will die, there's no way to get him to live, um, but you can kind of, you can have the little conversation with Garrus, which is, I quite like, because you kind of, you feel like you're stopping Garrus from going down a bad road of being, like, personally pursuing vengeance and killing people for stuff like that. That yes, the guy should have faced trial, but it was kind of his choice to turn against us, rather than our choice to turn against, just go mental and kill him. But anyway, let's head back. We've got a tiny bit of time on the end of the episode, so let's head back to the Normandy for a conversation with someone interesting. So, here at the Normandy's drive core, this means there's only one person we can talk be talking to, and it's Talizora Naraya. Oh, hello, Shepard. Are you okay? I don't know. Your ship is amazing, and your crew's been really great to me, especially your chief engineer. But I just sort of feel out of place. The Normandy runs so smooth, it feels like we're not even moving. And the engines are so quiet. How do you sleep at night? The silence wakes you up? Back on the flotilla, the last thing you want to hear is silence. It means an engine's died or an air filter shut down. I guess you don't have to worry about that here. But old habits die hard. But it's more than just a silence. This ship feels so empty. It's like half the crew is missing. Back home, I couldn't wait to go on my pilgrimage. I couldn't wait to get away from the crowds. Now that I'm out here, I kind of miss them. Sometimes we don't appreciate what we have till it's gone. That's true. I'm starting to wonder if that's what the pilgrimage is really about. It's given me a whole new perspective on my people and our culture. You know, there's always a few who go on their pilgrimages and never return. I always assumed something bad happened to them, but maybe they just wanted a different life. You do plan to return to the migrant fleet, right? I could never abandon my people, Shepard. I will go back eventually, but we have to stop Saren first. Otherwise, I might not have a home to go back to. 
I should go. See you later. And so that just gives us a bit of background on Tally and the kind of Quarians as a whole, because as I've bitched about before, they're not in this game much. It's more in later ones that they become interesting, so... It's nice to get the information you can when you can. But anyway, this episode we've done two side quests, and next episode, basically, I predict there'll be two more episodes of side quests. Um, and then we'll be getting onto something, well, it's not a plot world, but it's definitely something much more than a side quest and really quite interesting. Um, but yeah, next episode's going to be some more stuff, mostly around the same place we're in the Hades Gamma Cluster. So yeah, hope you'll join me then. Uh, I've been the Doctor with the Infamous Gentleman, and this has been Mass Effect. Thank you very much for watching, and good day.